the scrutinizer. This is the company I started recently, like a year ago, because I wanted to teach everyone critical thinking skills and uh, to uh, um, eliminate the misinformation. But uh, my background, I'm a biochemist. I have a doctorate in biochemistry and genetics. So biochemist, I study metabolism, gene expression. As a geneticist, we study how the genes are passed from parent to offspring or diagnose the hereditary conditions and then also study GMOs that we're going to do today. And so combining this, I'm a research scientist. I don't uh, see patients, but I do research because I like to test hypotheses and find out how and why. That's so most of you are you an MD too? Yeah. So, oh, I know that. so I'm an MD and a PhD, so, uh, but I do research. These are the two universities I graduated from. This up is the map of India, and this up north is this university where I did one of the doctorates. And here I grew up in Germany, so this is another uh, university I went to. This is near Frankfurt. It's called Gießen, and this is the university, the Liebig, um, University of Gießen. Okay. And uh, answering your question about why the research. So I have done no gene therapy for 12 years. I wanted to find the cure for bone marrow diseases. And uh, so I got to make knock-in and knock-out mice. What does that mean is that you can take the genes out of a mouse and cause a disease. You can put the genes in the mouse and you know cause the disease or cure the mouse. So in a way, these are GMO mouse, right? They're genetically modified. And I got to study all these diseases. So research, I, I don't regret it. I love doing research. Maybe you guys can think about it sometime. Okay, and coming back, why I started the scrutinizer is, again, GMOs, everyone has a lot of confusion. People are very confused about vaccinations or organic foods. And so, like I said, I want to teach the critical thinking skills, even you guys, that you should always look at the facts and think about what the facts are presented and then decide, hmm, is this person uh, making sense? Is it reliable or not reliable? Uh, okay, so this is uh, my page for the scrutinizer. Um, coming to the uh, real topic of Paleolithic and the Neolithic era, the Stone Age, so they both are called Stone Age, but they are very different eras, as <laughs> you can see. So Paleolithic era is called the Old Stone Age, right? So it goes from 70,000 to 12,000 BC. New Stone Age, Neolithic is called New Stone Age because they had an agricultural revolution. And from there, the society started becoming more modern uh, after the, you know, the use of agriculture. So in Paleolithic era, uh, they had all the animals we have. They had no dinosaurs. We don't have them either. But they had the mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. And their dogs had huge teeth, uh, giant sharks, and all that stuff. So how do the scientists know that the early man lived 3 million years ago? And the way I say it is Lucy told them. And not this Lucy from this cartoon, but Lucy was a skeleton that was found in Africa in 1974. So the scientists looked at it and they found that the bones are of a girl who died when she was about 20 years ago, uh, 20 years old. And the scientists named her Lucy. So whenever they find a old fossils or skeleton the scientists can always find out the age and here i've added today the radiocarbon oh, okay. <laughs> so that skeleton was three million years old so she was a cave girl and that's the, one of the reasons she was dead at 20 because in that time people used to die around 20 years of age why did the people die so early because they had very harsh conditions you know it was cold they were nomads they wandered around in search of food and the food they found that we will look at the uh, some of the foods the food also they found was not really palatable so in a way they did not get enough food for the size of their bodies 
So combining all this, they used to die uh, 20 to 30 years of age. How did they find out how old she was when she yes. died? In the past, um, the only method was to compare the layers of the fossil with other things present. But now what we do is it's called a carbon dating. Uh, or the radiocarbon. So C14, it's a radioisotope of carbon, which is a naturally occurring isotope. So it is formed when the atmosphere strikes nitrogen molecules in the atmosphere, and they oxidize to become carbon dioxide. So what happens is the plants and uh, everybody, they absorb carbon dioxide. So the population of C14, which is the isotope of carbon, it, it, it continues to be absorbed by the green plants until the plant dies. So also with the animals, it is also passed to the animals because we eat those plants. So after the death of the plant or the animal, the C14, because we are organic people, right? We have carbon in our bodies. So the amount of carbon-14, it decreases regularly. It doesn't decrease like spontaneously. There's a, a process it goes through. So as the molecules of the organic body, they decay, the C14 molecules are going to uh, decrease. So half-life, meaning half-life is when, so carbon's half-life is 5,730 years. This means in these years, half of the carbon would be gone from the specimen you're looking at. So it means uh, the object yeah, will lose half of its carbon. So when you have this kind of calculation, then any fossil you find, you measure its C14 content. And from there, you can now uh, find out how old this object or the skeleton is. So this is coming to the Paleolithic. This is old Stone Age, so it's food source. Uh, so they were nomads. That means they were constantly moving, and their life was only searching uh, food and water. They hunted animals, and they gathered plants, like berries and nuts or roots. So whatever they found. And then we have the Neolithic age. Like I said, this is the age when there was a green revolution or an agriculture revolution. So we are going to compare. Uh, in Paleolithic, like we said, they were nomads. And uh, Neolithic, because they learned how to farm or domesticate animals. So um, in the Paleolithic era, but they had invented the use of fire. And in Neolithic era, agriculture. Um, the houses, so like I said, Paleolithic people were nomads, so they lived in caves because they have to move. But Neolithic people, because they were farming and they had animals, they started making permanent homes made of wood or brick. And the clothing, they, both of them, they did wear fur or the skin of the animals. It was really cold where they lived. And, but in the Neolithic era, they did have the use of rope, which Paleolithic people didn't. Okay, so now going to Neolithic era, like we, uh, we just saw that they learned to farm. They could domesticate. The first domesticated animal was sheep. And the first domesticated variety or the plant was wheat. So this combined is called agriculture. And these people... They formed in Europe, Africa, Asia, and Americas. Uh, so this is the old the map of, uh, from that time. So here is the thing called the Fertile Crescent. So most of these people, they settled here because uh, this was called Fertile Crescent because it was a fertile land. And there they could um, farm or produce their wheat. So the earliest varieties, they were called Emma, Emmer and Einkorn. And Einkorn is derived from the German word exactly the way the German word would be. Ein means one, corn means the corn. So one corn. You see, this is what the Einkorn looked like. C14 dating again, like we can, we can, it's easy, we can find the age of anything. So C14 dating showed us that the earliest remains of this corn, so remains, they are, it's not around anymore, it was in uh, Syria. 
and farming from there had spread <laughs> to Mesopotamia, Egypt, everywhere, India, China, and Americas. So with the agriculture, then, you know, the, there was advancement was being made. So they needed plows. So the history of plow would be that 6000 BC, uh, the plow was made of wood. So this thing is wood and their shaft was also made of hardened wood by the fire. And it required two, pe two people or two men to pull it. In 5500 BC now, the plow was made of flint. So it was the wood and the blade was made of flint. So it's an improvement and it could be pulled by the oxen. And in 3000 BC was when the first uh, plow was made in China, uh, which had metal on it, so metal blade. And then um, the further progress happens and we they invent the wheel. So before that, they were using a log of wood and they would put their sledge on the roller to make it um, easy to pull. And this used to make grooves like here. And then the second thing or afterwards, they made the wheel from here because you see they made the grooves and they must have gotten the idea and they make the wheel and the axle. So it is fixed. And the last was the best one where sledge is on the rollers where they can join the axle into the crude uh, bearings. So in a way, the people are making advancement in agriculture and their everyday life. So the further advances, what happened were when the plow they made was, it was pulled by the horse collar. And the techniques, they, in, the techniques were involved in making wheat as a viable crop. So now because they were farming, they, need, they don't want their wheat to die. So they made advances in how they prepared the soil for the wheat. They learned to place the seeds in the soil at time, on the, on the right time. They, they did crop rotation and they used fertilizers even to improve the plant growth. So, and then they made advances in their harvesting methods. So, um, then the seed drills uh, um, were made in the 18th century for sowing of the seeds. So this increased the productivity a lot. And these are the harvesters. So like I said, they had made advances in harvesting their produce. So harvester is, it not only harvests the produce, but it gathers it as, as well. The first one was in 1833, the guy called Hasi. He had patented his reaper. So this was the major improvement. And this is the one that he did. So you see, if when it uh, uses it, it leaves the surface even and clean also. And the mechanical reapers, like I said, they all cut the grass, but they do other things also. Like they can... Um, they, get, they pick up whatever they cut. This is called windrowing. So windrowing is that there's a row of cut hay and the hay is first allowed to dry before it is rolled or baled. And then the modern machines, again, they cut and gather, but they do a lot of other things. They will thresh, which means loosening the edible part of the grain in the seed and then they would separate the grain from the shaft which is called winnow and they will deliver also to a truck or the wagon wherever it needs so this these new machines are called the combined harvesters and from here the there was development of the tractor drawn cultivator and planter so this we know and uh, the wheat varieties started to get better and better because they knew how to grow it now. And as we grow the seeds or as we grow a plant, it always undergoes genetic modification by itself. So the wheat was becoming better. So during the time, 1930 to 1960, uh, there was a revolution called a green revolution because here there was a... Uh, uh, the research was done by Norman and he had uh, given a lot of technology to agriculture. 
and it's called green revolution because of his techniques he saved more than a billion people from starvation that his methods and techniques were so good that we had so much food and for that he received a nobel prize in 1970 so this uh, was the modernization of the so, uh, technique so what he did he expanded the irrigation system he developed the high yielding varieties of cereal grains and then he also distributed hybridized seeds so hybridized seed meaning they were not the pure seed of the wheat they started with it was modified by itself um, but they are always better than um, the original seed so he had synthetic fertilizers and he even gave pesticides to the farmers so doing all this they he saved a billion people from starvation so the the diet that you guys are making the caveman diet or the paleo that would really be only meat and the fruit and vegetables so eggs and nuts but those people didn't really have this much food and in your paleo diet you cannot have grains or dairy products or processed foods like bread no chicken nuggets no potato chips cocoa puffs and no gummy bears that would be your caveman diet but what's the problem with it i mean uh, uh, lately a lot of adults they are always going on paleo diet which means they are eating just fruit and meat so first of all we our life we are not cavemen our life is not harsh we are not doing all that exercise to catch our food or get the berries and secondly uh, in this case if you don't have carbohydrates in your diet you definitely will lose weight because without carbohydrates you can eat anything and it does not um get metabolized so that's why they think they can eat a lot of fat it will clog the arteries but yes you would lose weight if you're not adding any carbohydrates however because of all these good stuff we have like chips and gummy bears they cannot live on the paleo diet forever people like us so the moment you will even eat bread uh people start gaining weight so diet is not ever a good way to go maybe keep it balanced and exercise that's what i say and it works so but the paleo diet uh that people are making or you guys are writing about it uh so in a way it's not really the exactly the same paleo diet that actually existed in the stone age because our animals first of all are are plump and bigger they are genetically different from what they had then the paleolithic fruit was very very small and tart our fruit is you know you've seen our fruits they are huge and sweet and tasty then the vegetables they were so small and they were just unpalatable you can't really eat them the ancient tomatoes they were the size of the berries uh, potatoes were tiny as a peanut so imagine this diet i mean you are making a diet yes people are going to eat paleo diet but they eat corn you know which is good and they eat it but here tooth cracking uh, clusters pen, as as small as a pencil eraser and cucumbers had spines on them as sea urchins and letter was bitter and prickly prickly lettuce yes they were so starchy and they couldn't eat it that they had to roast the peas like a chestnut and then peel them peas. so and their carrots once again like other vegetables they were very very like stringy and their beans they were naturally laced with cyanide so they must have discovered it when some people would die i mean otherwise they can't find it so coming to gmo the genetically modified what does that mean it means that if a gene from one organism is moved to another organism in the lab i mean if a human makes it so that is uh, that becomes a genetically modified organism so that's what's called a gmo and it's also called transgenic or the it's done by uh, transfer of genes but like i say even in the normal environment when over the years like they grew the wheat so every time they grow the wheat and it gets cross bred so that is a gmo as well because it is genetically modified it doesn't remain the same and i wanted to show here how it the things in the lab look like so this is a chromosome the way it exactly looks like on the chromosome is the dna 
So from the chromosome, you can extract the DNA. On the DNA, DNA there would be sequences of you know, the, the base pairs. They are called genes. So this, the genes, and the only way we can look in the lab is through this sequence. So when I extract DNA and I send it for sequencing, and this comes back. And from here, and nowadays it's very easy, you put in the database in the computer, it tells you like this red part I'm highlighting, uh, this is what gene. Uh, so this is uh, from here. Now let's say uh, this green sequence is what I want uh, is, let's say it is for making uh, sweet fruit. So what I can do is with the, these things are called enzymes, you can cut the green part out from this DNA. Uh, let's see if I have a, I had a slide, yes. So what you can do is, like this green part, I want to be putting in the variety we have, let's say tomato. So I cut this gene out and I can use the enzymes or whatever it needs to put paste it in my um, genomic DNA of the tomato we are looking at. So with that method, what happens is, so the yellow part is all the previous tomato genes. Green is the new gene that we added that would make the tomato sweet. So now what have we done? We have made a GMO. We replaced this normal gene. It cut out that sequence out of it for the bitter gene and we replaced it with our good tasty gene. So that's how a GMO is made. So this is the two methods. Yeah, it changed with the traditional way also, meaning, we can move the genes without doing transgenics in the lab, but that takes a very long time because you will find a plant, you will try finding a plant which has a sweet, let's say, apple or tomato, and then you will take your paleolithic apple and then you will start breeding both of them together and it takes years and years until you will get that plant which will have the desired trait then you will start growing that particular plant. So it is gonna take ages. Or we can take a shortcut as uh, because we have technology, we can take that gene the way I showed. You can take the sweet gene, put it in, or the, or the gene for making a uh, fruit bigger or whatever, and you can put it into your not so good plant. So that is, again, that is called the genetically modified crap, crop. So uh, it doesn't seem any, I mean, this seems better than the uh, traditional way because here you can control the gene. So to me, it does not look that the GMOs are dangerous. What do you think? Okay. Also because with GMOs, then we can produce the food for the entire world. Okay, this is an example. So, so most of the GMOs, they are geared towards making the plant pest resistant, for example. This is, this is a cotton plant. So like here, this is infested with, uh, with the pest. And, uh, <clears throat> and here, this cotton is growing. And so this was a GMO cotton that uh, the pest cannot uh, infiltrate it. This example I'm taking is that we can produce a lot of insulin, for example, in the lab. So this is synthetic insulin. Anything that's natural, the way people say it, doesn't mean it's healthy or it's good. And this is the same insulin, but we produce in the lab, so almost every patient can have it. So here's a human cell which produces insulin that would be pancreas or the islets of Langerhans. So this pink, this is a DNA where pink is our insulin gene. We are gonna put this gene in a bacteria. So we added it in the bacteria and uh, then we are gonna grow the bacteria. So this bacteria is al already called a transgenic bacteria, right? Because it has different gene in it. Then these bacteria we can grow in a Petri plate in an incubator, but because they are carrying the plasmid or the DNA for insulin, they are going to make a lot of insulin. So we will take these bacteria, extract insulin. And this is how now we have loads and loads of this hormone. Okay. Um, this we discussed it, but I wanted to go over. So engineering versus breeding. Engineering is our making the genetically modification in the lab. Breeding is the other method where 
you can you can take the plants and select, breed them like Mendel did with the sweet pea experiment. That's how all this genetics came into picture. He was called the father of genetics. So you uh, breed your plants, the two plants together, so that you can have the trait that you want. And it takes years and years. But the but the drawback is that you can sometimes get unwanted traits that are not safe because you cannot control in that setting. So the example is there were potatoes that were be, being made from the conventional breeding. And in there, unknowingly, the hybrid plant that we got, it was producing a high levels of alkaloids, glycoalkaloids. So alkaloids are present in the some of the plants and glycoalkaloids were are uh, not healthy. They were causing GI upset, neurological problems, dermatological problems. And so in a way it was an alkaloid poisoning. So in the normal breeding, we couldn't control that. But if we were doing our transgenics in the lab, we would know this and we can avoid this because we control where to put the trait. And so this, um, uh, like I said, with the example of cotton, most of the crops we grow today are to resist the pests. Or I had an example of this rice. Or they have made, for example, the golden rice. So the golden rice, because they have made um, more beta carotene in it. You know, carotene is vitamin A for our eyes. So which is giving its yellow color. So they genetically engineered uh, to have more of the vitamin A in it. And uh, according to science, once again, as you have looked at the data, and I want you to critically think, not because you cannot go against my words, okay? So at least from the data, I see the GMO foods are safe and we have been eating those for millions of years. And the difference uh, is that before the genetic tools emerged, the plants were GMOs from their environment, right? Um, okay, so I wanted to share this example of genetic modification in, for example, in mosquitoes. We can use the same technique of making a GMO mosquito because like there are these uh, countries where there is too much malaria. So we can change the DNA of the mosquito that they can, that the same mosquito will make a protein that when it goes uh, to uh, sting the person, it will either die or it will uh, or it uh, will prevent the development of the mosquito. You know, the cycle is mosquito stings in the red blood cells that the, you know, the whole life cycle happens and then more of the mosquitoes are made and the person gets malaria. So here, if we can succeed, we haven't succeeded yet, we can make GMO mosquitoes that would kill malaria by themselves. The other thing, uh, like in uh, European uh, consumers, the, going back to the GMOs, that there are two techniques, they are called like cisgenesis and transgenesis. So according to people, they, um, they are selective when they say they like the GMO or not. So cisgenesis is when the genes are used from the plants. So they are natural genes, like this is what people say, natural. And the trans would be when these are non-plant genes. So apparently in Europe, people are saying, okay, we, we can eat the cisgenesis plants, like apples, barley. They are all made with the genes of the plants. And... Um, uh, so, like they here, they genetically modified foods. They came under attack. They are always under attack. So they were called Franken food. So because they are considered unnatural, a man-made. But you know, man-made things are towards um, making progress. So this again, it ignores the fact that we have been making GMOs thousands of years by the normal method. I mean, we didn't make them in the lab, but, and so here is the example of the maze from, this is the GMO and this is from the ancient times. Let me ask you this one question. You were saying yeah. um, plant GMOs you're okay with, but not animal GMO. But you eat both and the body digests both. What's the difference? 
That's what I said. Um, as long as the gene is in the plant, it digests it, but we don't really absorb that gene. It's not like we can absorb that chunk of DNA, even if it's coming from animal, and say, oh, we got altered. That's not the way it works. So that gene, when you place it in the plant, because it has to be placed, like I showed the DNA sequence, there has to be a promoter, there has to be uh, things that will allow the expression of that gene. That's the only reason that plant is making the trait we want. But when we are eating the plant, it's not that gene is going in our DNA and, uh, and getting integrated anywhere. Because if that was the case, my gene therapy experiments, I didn't really have to work on it. I can feed the gene to animals, right? We can cure all these diseases, Alzheimer's and stuff by feeding people the gene. Right, but what about the animal? You made a distinction. Mm -hmm. That people think that if a plant is made by another, that a plant is containing a gene from the plant. They think that's safe in comparison to if the gene is coming from the animals. The one thing is like we share so much homology like with the fruit fly. Humans in lab, we are used studying fruit fly a lot to study the diseases of the humans because that their DNA or their chunks of genes are very similar to us. So if we are taking that gene, putting in a plant, that does not mean we are becoming a fruit fly or it's unhealthy or we are, we are getting a cancer or something. I was giving that European people's um, viewpoint because there everyone is saying that GMOs are man-made, they call them frankenfood, that they are dangerous. And so there are two techniques that have been used. One is with the plants, right? the, the gene from the plant is put in a plant. And then there is transgenesis where non-plant genes are used. So the European people are saying they're okay eating the cisgenesis. But not the trans. Plants. But not the trans because they think it's not coming, the gene is not coming from a plant. It could be from an insect. It could be from an animal. But So the way I understand what you're asking me is there is no distinction. It should be fine whether the gene comes from a plant or from an insect. The DNA sequence remains the same and that's why I gave the example of the fruit fly because we have the homology. So these plants, if they have homology to that gene, wherever we take that gene, it's just a sequence of DNA. So we are not absorbing it. Whether plant or animal. Yes. So GMO plant or GMO animal doesn't make any difference. What I'm saying is GMO, uh, in this case, I'm saying the gene has been taken from an animal put in a plant. Now, if we have made a GMO chicken, for example, um, so those things, I, um, if they've done it right, yes, there should not be any harm in it because they have only made them bigger or more meat and stuff. So it should not, uh, that's all I'm going to say, it should not be a problem. Do you see when it would be a problem? Um, I, the reason I say should is because an animal like a chicken would be less harmful, for example, than a cow because of the life cycle of these animals. So chicken dies at a younger age than a cow lives much longer. So we cannot anticipate if there would be any harmful effect uh, of the animal because after all it has all the systems we have it has blood and flesh and all that okay i got you yeah and this is how uh, for example the mad cow disease that came in the picture only because so it's a prion disease it's a protein there's no way that disease could have entered the humans from the cows but the farmers they were being greedy and they were feeding the cows the dead cows so first of all cow is a vegetarian animal but then feeding them the dead cow so the cow that was infected with prion in the brain when the humans ate it then that disease has now infiltrated the human society right so that's what i'm trying to say maybe chicken does the same because they feed chicken the dead chicken also but the chicken lives a shorter life so maybe that's why we don't know what can happen by eating that kind of chicken and we have found out the hard way what happens if you're feeding cow the dead cow 
I got you. Yeah. Very interesting. If they had a disease, what type of medicine or what medicine would they use? Think about it. We just talked about critical thinking. So I want you to think. Uh, we are discussing Paleolithic era where we are saying they only knew how to uh, make fire. They moved from places. So here you can use your critical thinking skills in light of the facts we just discussed that I was asking you, what you tell me. Do you think, how do you think they took care of themselves back then? There, there was no... I mean, was there medicine? I mean, because they, didn't, they even ran around only for food. So apparently they did not have any medicine. It's possible that they discovered um, that some of the plants, they would have um, these characteristics. Like malaria, the quinone came in picture because uh, people found that when they licked the bark of the tree, a particular tree, their fever reduced. So then as the science developed and we looked into it, so we found that it has quinone and that uh, takes care of malaria. So until as the Paleolithic people had some plants, they thought, okay, this takes care of them. But apparently they didn't because they died when they were 20. Yeah. Okay, Dr. No. Wow. Yeah, thank you so good. much. Thank you. Okay, that's fine.